let's let's jump in. So I, I thought uh, we talk a little bit just to begin with uh, about Intifada. There's a lot of talk about Intifada. There's uh, of course the, the chance out there of Intifada. There are a lot of claims being made about what Intifada actually means um, and what it refers to. Uh, and uh, uh, of course, we've seen what happened with the um, with the heads of. Uh, the presidents of the universities the other day in front of Congress. Just an update on that quickly. Uh, just before I saw the sh- just before I started the show, I did see that the board of trustees of the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia, the University of Pennsylvania, so Penn, um, is actually has actually uh, asked the president of the university to resign. Uh, she was one of the three uh, presidents of the universities. Uh, in front of Congress, they just completely blew their answer uh, to the question uh, regarding, um, uh, you know, uh, what would, is is calling for Jewish genocide harassment. They completely blew it, um, and uh, all three should resign just because of how pathetic the response was. But more than that, they really should resign because of how pathetic the, the way they're managing the campuses is, the pathetic state of, of our universities. Of course, having them resign will not change much. Uh, the real rot at our universities is not primarily in the president's office. Uh, the real rot at the university uh, is uh, in, the, uh, in, the, uh, uh, in the faculty, uh, in the DEI departments, in the, in the through and throughout the administration, I do not believe, I don't think there's any chance that replacing the president at any one of these universities will change anything significantly. I, I also think, this is before we get to the issue of Intifada, we'll get to that in a minute, I also think that the universities really have to think clearly about free speech and the kind of speech they want in their campuses. They are not, as private universities, the three were private universities, they're not obliged uh, uh, on university property to have the First Amendment as the standard for speech. They don't have to allow the Nazis or the KKK or the those calling for uh, uh, Jewish uh, genocide to march on their campuses. They have every right, and I would argue responsibility, not to allow certain voices on campus. I do not believe in the bizarre notion that they have of academic freedom, which suggests that a university should just sit back and allow anybody to say anything whenever they want. Now, that's true that the government cannot silence you, even if you are you know, arguing for something horrific. But a university is an institution of learning. The university is an institution uh, of, of education. A university should have standards. Now, I know it's hard to apply the standards. And, and the default is let everybody say whatever they want to say, and as long as they're not breaking the law, they can do whatever they want. That's a default. But that's defaulting on your responsibility as an educational institution. And what is actually happening, which I think makes everything worse, is that the standards that they apply, because they are applying standards even though they have this position of you can say anything except insult blacks or except insult transgenders or except uh, create, except uh, uh, add on the, the intersectionality woke uh, uh, exceptions that they would like and they do uh, include, right? So you can call for genocide of Jews, but not for genocide of other peoples. So the standards they have chosen without admitting it are the chance uh, uh, the standards of the, of the far left. That's what allowed speech and what's not allowed. What they should do is the same as I think what Twitter should do and Facebook should do and all these places, and they all have the same problem. They're all private institutions. They all can have their own standards. I don't think if it's legal, okay. 
I, I don't think that's that, that that is ideal for university, and I don't think that's an ideal for social media. I think they have to consider the purpose of the institution, the purpose of their platform, and consider and think about objective standards for what is acceptable and what's not acceptable in terms of behavior, in terms of speech, in terms of protest, what protests acceptable, what are not, and actually have standards and actually stand by those standards. And that should apply to professors and students and everybody else. But that's hard. It's hard to think through what kind of speech a Nazi is acceptable. No. Communists? Well, that's going to be hard for them. If Nazis are not, why would you allow communists? And if communists are not, who else is not? And what's the standard? Right now, the standard is discriminate against anything that the woke left wants you to discriminate against. But that, that is wrong. And that is not objective. So, so yeah, the university president should resign. But I think Don said yesterday when I interviewed him, he said, Look, the, the university system as it is, is unsalvageable. And I think there's, that's probably true, at least in our lifetime. It's unsalvageable. And what that means is that the money, the donors, they need to start thinking about alternatives. They need to start thinking about new institutions. This is what's exciting about the University of Austin, exciting about other projects that are going on around the country. We need more, bigger, more ambitious. And we need it quickly. Um, but without changing the fundamental culture on campuses, and that's going to require firing or eliminating the DEI office, that's going to require changing some of the faculty composition. Ultimately, I don't think you could do it without eliminating tenure. Um, because everybody's already in, in, entrenched and they only approve the people who they like and therefore it, 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 it's endless. You cannot change American universities. It's too late. Too late. Um, all right. Um, Danielle, thank you. Wow, $100, really appreciate that. That's great, thank you. And then uh, uh, Robert, thank you. Uh, Mary Aline, thank you. Um, yeah, I know that's uh, good. I that, really appreciate it. Okay, back to Intifada. So in our universities, people are marching for global Intifada, and they're marching for Intifada. And, and what does it actually mean? Well, well Intifada is, uh, you know, a, 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 a word in Arabic I had the meaning a minute ago. What was the, the actual meaning of intifada? It's like shake things up. Uh, it's um, uh, yeah. It's it's like shiver, shudder, tremor, shake off to shake, right? Shake, get rid of, maybe even shrug, <laughs> right? But that's not what they mean when they march advocating for intifada. They mean something very specific. They're referring to um, an uprising, and it's, and it's, it's come to mean uh, uprising, revolution. And they talk about globalize the intifada or intifada revolution. So what is intifada referred to? Well, the intifada refers to two events in the history of Israel-Palestinian let me call it a war, right? The war, the conflict, whatever you want to call it. One uh, started in December 1987, which started in, um, in Gaza and then spread to the, to the West Bank, which was basically uh, people, uh, uh, Palestinians going onto the streets uh, and, and throwing rocks at, at Israelis, throwing rocks at the military. Uh, they were at the time regularly going to work in Israel, uh, refusing to go to war. It was... It was like, you know, we want a resolution to this. And, they, you know, it, it, it all arose out of a, a, a car accident in which a number of Palestinians died. 
Uh, but at the core of it was frustration at what they thought was what they viewed as an occupation uh, and uh, poverty and the lack of opportunity and, a, and, and, you know, and a hatred for Israel. But it wasn't anyway near the way it is today. And, and that intifada, initially, the, Israel used, um, uh, you know, tried to crush these protests and riots. Um, and uh, that only made things worse. Ultimately, Israel shifted to using rubber bullets so they wouldn't kill anybody. Uh, that didn't help. Uh, you know, ultimately, it was put down. But um, it, it was months and months of, of, of violence but the violence was ba mainly localized in the West Bank and in Gaza and was demonstrations and riots. That was Intifada number one. But nobody really remembers Intifada number one because Intifada number one didn't really leave a real mark. What people, when they're talking about the Intifada, are really talking about the second Intifada. The second Intifada was launched in 2000 after Yasser Arafat in Camp David was basically offered pretty much, you know, everything he wanted by Bill Clinton and, and Ehud Barak, which, who was the prime minister at the time of Israel. I think, I think by, by American estimates, he, he was given over 90% of what he'd asked for. And he basically said no. This is after the Oslo agreements. Yes, Arafat was in the West Bank. And he went back to the West Bank and, and basically launched the Intifada, the second Intifada. But this Intifada was very different. This Intifada was not demonstrations and riots and throwing rocks. This is an Intifada was a massive surge of terrorist attacks targeted at civilians in Israel. This is a time where there were very little restrictions on the ability of Palestinians to move around Israel, to enter Israel, to exit Israel. And this is a period of about three years in which, almost on a weekly basis, buses were blown up, restaurants were blown up, wedding celebrations, suicide bombers would enter wedding celebrations and blow themselves up. A period in which Israel, Israelis never knew when the attack would happen, where, you know, hundreds and ultimately thousands of people killed, maimed, injured. And it could happen anyway, at any time, which increased kind of the, the, the randomness, the scariness of it, the terror of the situation. And this is what Intifada has come to mean. Intifada means the terrorizing of innocent men, women, and children. It means the killing, the blowing up of women, children, civilians. Now, of course, they don't consider them innocents. It means the arbitrary random destruction. It means a reign of terror. When they call for a globalized the Intifada, they're calling for a global reign of terror. They're calling for not just blowing up buses in Israel, but blowing up buses everywhere. They're talking about the kind of terror attacks that ISIS committed in Europe during the mid-2000s. They're talking about 9-11s and shootings and cars driving through crowds. They're talking about mayhem and death and destruction on a global scale. When they talk about Intifada revolution, they're talking about the rising up of I don't know whom, but everywhere. The killing, the slaughter, the maiming, the destruction of civilians everywhere. That's what Intifada means. Now, I don't know how many of the people chanting it know what it means. Probably very few. Just like when you ask people, uh, when they say uh, from the river to the sea, what river? They have no idea. They can't name the river. They can't name the sea. 
By the way, it's from the Jordan River to the Mediterranean Sea. That, that's the reference. Uh, this is what Intifada means. This is why it's evil. This is why it's a call for violence. It's a call for terror. It's a call for revolution. Should one, should universities just allow anybody to call for any kind of revolution whenever they want? Certainly, if somebody wants to write an op-ed in the, in the New York, if somebody wants to write an op-ed in the New York Times calling for uh, intifada, if they are serious, if they are actually putting together the mechanisms by which an intifada would be launched, wouldn't that be inciting for violence? Wouldn't that be a violation of the First Amendment? Wouldn't that be not free speech, but actual violence? Granted, if you're just a kid and you're just shouting intifada, intifada, you don't know what you're doing, you're not putting it, this is the context that those, that those presidents were talking about, you're not putting the mechanisms in place to actually have a revolution. All right, maybe you have the legal free speech to do that, right, to do that. But should you be allowed to do it on a campus? Any more than should you be allowed to call for the reenslavement of blacks on campus? I don't think so. I mean, they're just certain things that are uncivilized. That an educational institution in the name of educating should not tolerate. We should not be tolerate, tolerant of all views. In educational institutions, there are certain views that should be beyond the pale. And, and you know what? Institutions can compete. Not all institutions can have the same exact standards, just like not all social media should have exactly the same standards. And let's see what happens. Let's see what facilitates good education. Let's see what encourages students to come. Let's see what encourages parents to send their kids to. Yeah, one of Freeman says enlightened institutions. That's what enlightened institutions are. Enlightened doesn't mean, yeah, you, you want to call for the killing of Jews? Fine. You want to call the killing of, of homosexuals? Fine. No problem. Go ahead. You want to burn crosses in the school, uh, in the school thing? Oh, that's fine. It's free speech after all. No. No. They have to be they have to be standards. They should be objective. They should be clear. Professors, students should know what's acceptable and what's not. They shouldn't be, and, and they should be, I'll put it this way, they should be based on an objective standard of what is and what is not within the scope of reasonable. But yeah, I mean, the challenge there, of course, is what people consider reasonable today is complete nuttiness. And, but this is why in private institutions, it's okay. They get it wrong. They can fix it. They can change it. No doubt that Facebook and Twitter all get it wrong, but the world does not end because they got it wrong.